Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Last week, we started teaching on decisions, making right decisions. And um, before, we, before we start recording real good, uh, I know it may be a little cool this morning, but it is like hot enough to cure tobacco in here. I mean, I'm, I'm looking up there expecting to see the sticks hanging from the rafters. Hallelujah. How do you know how hot the cured, how hot it, because I worked in tobacco fields and hung in the barns. I know what it is. It's hot enough to cure tobacco. <laughs> Lord Jesus, have mercy. So I, I think somebody got the hint, did they? put turn the air conditioner on. All right. Last week, we started talking about making right decisions, how to make decisions. And uh, we started off talking about this, that everybody has the right to make decisions. Not only do you have the right, you have the obligation to make decisions. Amen. Um, you have the right to make wrong decisions. You have the right to make bad, good decisions. But you also get the consequences of either one. Amen. 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 Uh, one, one trans, I think Philip's translation talks about the man's harvest in life depends solely on what he, what he sows. Depends solely on what he sows. You know, you sow wrong, you, you make bad decisions, you get bad consequences. Amen. You make good decisions, you get good consequences. Amen. And so we talked, we did share a little bit about different Bible characters who made some bad decisions. We started off with Adam. I think he stands number one. Uh, he stands right up to the plate as number one in the lineup of bad decision makers. Amen. He was out on the backside of the garden fishing where Eve came up with the fruit and just gave it to him. And he went, oh my God, I, why did you give me that fruit? I didn't know what it was. And then he started to pass the buck routine. Remember that? We talked about that last week. How the God came down and said, who told you you were naked? He said, well, the woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit and I did eat. You know, so not, uh, uh, indirectly, it was God's fault. How many people blame God indirectly for stuff that's going on? Well, you know, if you hadn't led me out here to live by faith, I wouldn't be here. Come on now. We can always blame God. You know, just like Adam did. Adam, Adam kind of blamed the woman, but in blaming the woman, he made sure God knew it was really his fault because the woman you gave me you had to give me this woman. Now, wait a second. Earlier, God's bringing all the animals by. There's no help meat found for him. Amen. He won't interest in the elephant, the zebra. The, I mean, I don't blame him. Amen. He pulls that rib out, makes a woman. He, he makes, the, makes a, a partner for him. He wakes up, looks at him, and goes, whoa, man. That's where the word woman came from. <laughs> so slow on the draw there, guys. Come on now. Hallelujah. And... Uh, but now that she's got him in trouble, look, you, you gave her to me, and you're the one that gave her to me. Pass the buck. Then we get, then we get uh, uh, who else gave, made a bad decision? Then we get uh, David and Bathsheba. Remember we talked about how David, the kings, went to war. David stayed behind, and when he stayed behind, he went up on the roof, and there was Bathsheba, butt naked, taking a bath next door. Hello. You know, now what did the Bible say? There was a time of the year that the kings went forth to battle. David remained behind in Jerusalem, sent Joab in his place. Now, where was David supposed to be? Battle. The whole city could have been on the roof butt naked, and he wouldn't have seen her if he was where he was supposed to be. Hello? So he made a bad decision. That bad decision led to more bad decisions. Because again, then he goes to the guys and goes, who is that woman? She said, that's Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. <laughs> Go get her. He didn't cover his eyes and run and say, no, my eyes have seen things I shouldn't see. He said, Go get the woman. Then he, then he slept with her, got her pregnant, then, then started the conspiracy to commit a cover-up. And then when that didn't work, he, he conspired to commit murder. Hello. So another bad decision in life. Then Saul, remember this? Samuel comes up one day after they've gone out, you know, and Samuel's up all night. You know, Saul's about rejoicing he's, he, because he thinks he's done everything the Lord told him to do. Hallelujah. He's back there with King Agag tied up over there. The people got the best of the sheep, the lamb, and all the, all the oxen and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and I really think Agag's being tortured to find out where the gold is. Because that's why he, he didn't keep him alive for any other reason. He wouldn't know where the money was. Saul gets, and the Lord's talked to Saul all night. Saul shows up, and Samuel runs out. Whoa, I did exactly what the Lord said. Really? Uh, how, wh why am I hearing sheep bleeding and cattle lowing? Oh, oh well, Pass the buck again. The people. You know, the people you made me king over. The, the, it's their fault. So it's God's fault again. They wanted, to, they wanted to spare the best to sacrifice to you, Lord. Now they're going to spiritualize in their, their disobedience. Hello? 
How many people have spiritualized their disobedience? And so, uh, and I, you know, and I, but I kept Agag alive. And then Saul says, uh, Samuel says, well, just stay here. I got to take care of something. Samuel actually goes and kills Agag. I mean, it's kind of like, look, excuse me. Okay, here's what the Lord said. That's not love. Let's save that for another day. What are we, so we talked about those guys. Now we're, here we are today. What are we, we're supposed to make right decisions. Now let me say something here. You cannot make a good, well, any decision requires information. Bad decisions require information. Bad information. Amen. Hello. Right. You know, I'm going to buy this house. Yeah, they didn't tell you it's in a 25-second floodplain. Well. Not a 25-year floodplain. It, flood, it floods all the time. Okay? You know, it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's flood-prone here, but you don't find that out until, you know, dry season's over and all the rains come, and now you're out there with water, I mean, sandbags trying to keep it from flooding. You made, you made a bad decision. You didn't get the right information. Okay. You look on the internet, get this car that is a cream puff baby, I mean for fourth, a fourth of its retail value on, on, on Blue Book. And you didn't check to find out if there was a salvage title on it or a flood title on it. Because I tell you, one thing you don't buy is a, now the salvage, I understand, you know, it's, it's more than, it was 25% more than its value and they, they totaled it and they put a whole new front end on it. Okay, whatever. Okay, I get that. But the flood. All the electronics get water in them, and they're going to go bad. All right? But, but yeah, there's a cream puff. I mean, you're shouting, woo, look at that, ooh, baby, and I'm getting a deal. If it's too good to be true, unless the Lord's doing it, it is. Huh? That Fiat Sports Fighter. I'm going to buy the new one. Hallelujah. 2017, they're reintroducing the Fiat 124 Sports Spider Roadster in America. Whew. I used to have 124 when I, when I was young. I had a 124, 74, and then a 79. And I'll tell you, I missed it, but I've been dreaming about having one again. They haven't been in America in 40, um, 35 years or whatever, and they're, they're bringing it back. <sighs> Hallelujah. Faith, get my faith out there. Why do you think they're bringing it back? Because <laughs> Pastor Ed wanted one. <laughs> the only reason Fiat introduced it was my faith summoned it from Italy. Hey, out of Italian, the motor band. Hey, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You got to have the right, but see, as believers, we have to have the right information from the right place to make the right decision to get the right blessings and the right end, uh, results. Yeah. Well, where does that come from? Let me tell you where it don't come from. Your friend. Well, I'll tell you what I would do. Just go up to them when they, when they say that. Go right up to them. Take your hand and go. I don't want to hear you. I can do that. She's my daughter. All right? If it's a random member of the church, I might get sued. I might have gotten bit. It's Proverbs 129. Well, 128. Look at Proverbs 1. We've got to back up a couple of verses or so there in Proverbs to get the gist of this. Hallelujah. But if we're going, if we're going to get the right things, you've got to get it from the right place. It says in Proverbs 1, 27, it says, um, yeah, that's right, okay. 28, that's right, I said 28, didn't I? 28 is where I start. Then shall they call upon me, and I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they will not find me. Now, how many, how many want to quote the verse, you know, they to call upon the Lord, he, you, know, he, you know, he'll renew them and all the, all the things we have about calling upon the Lord. But he says here, they, if, when some people call on him, he won't answer. Why? For they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would not, or they wouldn't receive any of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Now, you can't run around here and choose to disobey God, do contrary to what God says, reject his word, and then say, Lord, bless me. Inspect, you're going to get, well, I'm under grace. I'm going to get blessed. No, you ain't. When you reject his knowledge, when you reject his counsel, when you make a decision not to follow after what he says, you can't get in on the blessings. Well, I'm under grace. It don't matter what I do. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. 
You know, like I said, that's stupid on steroids. SOS. Hallelujah. No, you cannot reject the counsel of the Lord. So you can't go to the wrong places and get counsel and expect to get the blessings that come from the right counsel. All right? Proverbs 3 says this, Envy thou not the oppressor, and choose none of his ways. Why? The, you know, well, look at them. They're driving around this kind of car. Well, they're selling drugs. Well, the Lord, the, I'm under grace. It don't matter. I can go sell drugs and, and, and get that car because God wants to bless me. I mean, somebody, those people that, that, that think like that, they just walk into a pinball machine place and all the things start going tilt. And they ain't even touched them. They just get near it and they go tilt. Ding, 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 ding. You can't be that crazy. You can't think. If you envy the oppressor and you choose his ways, you're not going to get blessed. All right? Next verse. Um, look at Luke chapter 10. Luke. Luke. I am your father. Anyway, I'm sorry. It, just, it comes out every time I start thinking about Star Wars. You know, Luke, I am your father. Obi-Wan didn't tell you, did he? Verse 42. Help if I got in the right chapter. Luke 4 don't work. Good book. Wrong scriptures. Luke 10, 38. Now it came to pass as they went, they entered into the certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. That's Jesus. And she had a sister called Mary. And she sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Now, know what was she doing? She served. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving and came to him and whining. She, she had that wine on. She had a wine on. Are you here? I'm, I'm surprised Jesus didn't say, you want a little cheese to go with that wine? Lord, dost thou not care? Now, listen, look at this. Dost thou not care that my sister left me alone to serve? Bid her, therefore, come, that she come and help me. Now, stop. Now, Martha's entertaining the master in her home. Mary hears him teaching. She says, forget the dishes, forget the ham, forget the, well, no, no ham there. Uh, for, forget the lamb, you know, forget the oxen, forget the beef stew, forget all that. Hey, when he, I, gonna go, I got to go hear what he's saying. Amen? And, she, and, and Martha gets upset. And she runs to the Lord, don't you care? Now, when you're, when you're not getting where you want to be and you start going to the Lord and blaming him by saying, don't you care? Oh, if you, if you, you couldn't care and leave me here in this state. No, that's not true. That my sister's left me here alone. Now, she's, she's, she wants to show out. You ever been people who want to show out how great they could host? <laughs> okay. Now that Jeff has told us who it was. Brother, all right, she's left me here to serve alone. But Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things. The one, this one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. She made a decision. She made a decision, you know, that to, trying, to be, trying to be the best server, trying to you know, put on the show, trying to have the best layout, outdo all the other sisters in the church. Come on now. You know, I mean, you might have cat fighting at fellowships sometime in, in, in churches because who, who had the best pot roast or who had the best this, who had the best fried chicken. I mean, you know, they're about to fight over who, who the pastor thought was the best. It's all good. If it's fried chicken, it's good. I just don't know if I've ever had chicken that was fried that won't good. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. I mean, you know, I, talked to, I told one Dominican pastor, I, I, asked, I asked him, how do you say chicken graveyard in Spanish? He had a big old belly, and I knew he'd been eating a lot of fried chicken. That was a chicken graveyard sitting right there. <laughs> Hallelujah. No, but Mary said, you know, all this stuff can wait. It's right to serve the Lord. It's right to be about the Lord's business. It's right. But you got to make the decision to be at his feet first. You got to be at the master's feet first. If you're going to be equipped to serve properly. And so Mary said, uh, sis, listen, the food, the fish, all that stuff can be on hold. I'm going to sit and learn from the master. And Martha got upset. 
And Jesus said, you know, it ain't just this you're troubled about. There's a lot of things you're careful and troubled about. She's chosen. See, she knows the secret to making good choices. And that is to hear his word. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. And then Joel 3, 14 talks about this. It says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And let me say this. There, we live our lives on a daily basis making decisions. We got it this morning. You made a decision. You made a decision to get out of bed and come to church. There's a bunch of folks that made a decision to get out of bed and stay in uh, look, look at the floor and crawl back over and stay in bed. Or they made a decision to go, go eat at Cracker Barrel for breakfast and not go anywhere else. Or they made a decision that their golf game needed an extra few rounds and they're out there at the golf course right now. Hello? They, what were they? They were decisions. And they have the right to make those decisions. And I'm not going to tell you you're going straight to hell for making that decision. But let me tell you that when the crisis of life come, you know, your golf swing ain't going to deliver you. Amen. Nor is Charles Barclays. Oh, my. I saw a cap showed me a video of Charles Barclays' golf swing last night. I thought, that ain't a golf swing. I don't know what it is. I mean, it's It's horrid. I mean, the Brits have that. That's the right word. The Brits would use that word. It's horrid. Okay? <laughs> that, that would be the proper word, you know? Anyway, your golf swing is not going to deliver you. The Cracker Barrel, um, you know, Uncle Herschel's, all you, whatever breakfast Uncle Herschel's is, is not going to deliver you. Those bed sheets, even if they're 400 thread count, are not going to deliver you. But what you go and get when you come to church in the word of the Lord and the anointing of God and those things planted in you that grow and mature and prosper in your life, the word of God, that will be in the hour of crisis and the hour of need, that which you need to deliver you. So that's why we have to make the right decision. Well, what, why should I go to church? Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as is the manner of some. Why? Because in the word of God, when they come together, what? Iron sharpens iron. A threefold cord is not easily broken, praise God. That the word of the Lord is delivered. You receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Your suke, not your spirit. You don't get born again. Every time you come to church, your soul gets renewed. Your soul receives the word of God. It goes in and it changes how you think. Why is that important? Well, let's look, if you will, into Romans, the first chapter. I'm not going to read all this. There's a lot here. Let's we'll start in verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is, what? The power of God unto salvation. Soterius. Soterius is the Greek noun for the Greek verb sozo. The Greek uses the verb to de define the noun. In opposite of English, we use the noun to define the verb. But, you know, in the Greek, so the, the word sozo, we've heard that, you know, to, you know, to be saved, to be healed, to be delivered, to be preserved. That's what it, well, soterius is the noun form of that. So salvation, healing, okay, deliverance, pres preservation, okay. And so the word of God or the gospel of Christ, is the power of God unto Soterius. It'll, it'll, it will save you. It will heal you. It will deliver you. It will preserve you. And Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I, too many churches are ashamed of the gospel. Now, they, ju they jump on that part of good news, and they just want to preach. Well, they say they, they define good news as only happy. Now, no, no, no. Good news is this. You're lost without God, without, the, uh, without uh, you're lost in your sin without God. This word, you're on the way to hell. But... Jesus came to deliver you. If you'll believe on him, you get to go. What? The good, news, the, the good news doesn't ignore your state. It has the answer to your state. That's why it's good news. Okay? It doesn't mean we only preach happy, clappy stuff. Hello? No. It addresses and then answers. That's good news. Why? Because people, whenever you address, if you address sin, if you address adultery, you address fornication, you address homosexuality, you address thievery, you address, you know, debauchery, whatever you address, well, that makes me feel bad. Wait, 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 wait. Because, see, the people who are living there already feel bad. We've, we've, we've just pinpointed where you are, and now we come back and say, now we've got the solution to get you out. That's where it becomes good news. It doesn't deny the existence of it. It doesn't act like it's not there. It didn't just tell you, God loves you just like you are, you know, and, and um, you can, and listen, 
the way people preach now, yeah, you can stay like you are and you'll still get to go to heaven. You lying dog. And you're going to have to answer to God for sending people to hell. Hello. Telling people lies like that and letting them go to hell while you pull in the money. And, oh, I'm sorry. Anyway. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and to the Greek. For therein, what, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. I'm going to have to read all this. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. How much, where's the wrath of God revealed? How much? Now, I know people saying that God doesn't have any wrath. Paul is the New Testament preacher of grace, isn't he? And where did he say his God's wrath was against? All ungodliness. <laughs> See, well, how much? All. Now, listen, all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. What do you do? They're taking the truth and they're turning it and changing it. Now, let me tell you, for, for personal gain. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. I've, I've seen Christians do this. They start professing stuff, and they act like they're the genius on everything. You know? And let me tell you something. If, God, if you're listening to somebody and they go, God showed me. And they came back up to showed me, don't listen to them anymore. And I'm talking about back it up with scripture. Well, the, I was walking through the house and God spoke to me and told me such and such. <clears throat> That's great. Could you go prove it out with the word? You can't go teach it as doctrine if you can't prove it out with the word. Come on now. You can't go right here and start telling everybody, well, you know, uh, I got a revelation. There is no, all scripture. There's no private of interpretation of the scripture. Why? Well, it's open to all by the Holy Ghost. You don't get to have special revelations. There's no such thing as special revelations for individuals who can have a special revelation and nobody else can get it. If God shows you something, it's for the purpose of, of working in your life and sharing it with others from the word. You can't prove it out with the word. You can't have faith to live it. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Where was I? Romans 1. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds, four-footed beasts, creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now, what is this? This is all a decision. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, but became vain in their imagination. They made a decision to go a different direction. Who changed the truth of God into a lie, worship and serve the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. For this cause God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. I've heard this statement and heard this statement. Well, you know, we have to love and God loves people and God made people so they could love. And that, that when women love women in, the, in, in that intimate way, it's the love of God in manifestation. Does anybody have a barf bag I can borrow for a minute? Hello? The Bible doesn't say anything in the New Testament against homosexuality. Really? I just read it. And it's called vile affections. It's called dishonoring their body. And if you got a thing on your church that says we're the such and such community church and we, we, we love the LBGT community and we will marry you and we will join you together and say and preach sermons that doesn't address your, your, your sin and all this stuff, you're going to hell. I don't care if you got reverend, the most anointed prophetess, whatever on your title, you're going to hell. You're a liar. You're a deceiver. God, God calls it vile. God calls it unnatural. He calls it the dishonoring of your body. And likewise, I'm sorry. So even for the women, they change the natural use into that which is against nature. 
And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly. It actually means shameful. And receiving in themselves that recompense of their error. That was meat. Now what that means is they, they, they necessarily received what they were due because of their error. And even as they did not like to retain God in the knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. The word reprobate means void of judgment. This is why it's so important to go to the word of God and get your answers. I don't care what Mr. Ph.D. has to say. I don't care what Mr. Seminary uh, Professor has to say. I don't care what Mr. What's, whatever his face or whatever her face says. You know, they, they, they keep rewriting the Bible, rewriting history to, to line up with theirs. They got, the, they, they got the, queer, the, the, the queer James Bible now or something. The Queen James Bible, that's what it is. The Queen James Bible. And they take out any reference to homosexuality being a sin in the whole thing. Any reference that deals with homosexuality as being wrong is removed. To justify their life. He who takes anything away or adds anything to, let him be a curse of Nethmia. That's when it's talking about. It's not talking about having the Hagen study notes in the front. Because you're not changing scripture. But when you change scripture, you took away or you add to. Let him be a curse of Nethmia. Those are not good terms. What does it mean? I was watching McClinic one time. Well, I watched McClinic a lot of times. John Wayne's movie, The McClinic. You know, and he's got a, a Slim or Shim or whatever his name is out there. And, and Marina Hare comes in and says, uh, wipe that smile off your unprepossessing face. And he's on the carriage and McClinic comes out. And he goes, now go ahead, do this, do this. He says, hey, Mr. McClinic, what does unprepossessing mean? He said, Sam, I was called that once. Looked up in the dictionary. Better you just don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, uh, so uh, anathemia, curse anathemia, just, just don't get there. You don't want to be cursed or anathemia. All right? You don't want to be in that status. Hallelujah. Uh, go ahead. Oh, where am I? I'm back over here. Getting down here. So, they, listen, he calls this receiving in the cells the recompense of their error. When you make decisions in rebellion to God and his word, you're not going to get the blessing. You can come into church and you can have your, you know, set of confessions. You can have your tape of confessions. But if you go out and live contrary to the confession you're making, you're not going to get the results of the confession. Because what? I'm going to prove it to you with just one statement. The Apostle James, in reference to works, not the works of the law as Paul referred to. When you study Paul's writing, when Paul says works, he's talking about the works of the Old Testament law. In other words, offering the sacrifices will save me. Okay, Paul says, you know, that, you know, that, that, that those kind of works won't do anything. James, on the other hand, when he makes reference to works, is talking about corresponding action to your faith. Show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Okay, so James says this. Um, he said, faith without works is dead being alone. So if you're making confessions of faith and you don't have actions that correspond to it, it's dead being alone. It won't work. I said it won't work. I don't care how much you confess it. And I don't care if you go around and you get every grace book on the world. And you, say, you tell everybody I'm under grace. Lay down the front row. Say, I'm, I'm, I'm a grace person. Hallelujah. Ooh, I'm under grace. God's going to bless me. And I, don't, I don't tithe and I get blessed. Matter of fact, you wouldn't be on the front row of the church because you don't have to come to church. And you don't have to obey. And you don't have to submit. And you don't have to give. And you don't have to tithe. And you don't have to whatever else because you're under grace. So therefore, you wouldn't even be here to tell us. But you'll buy the books and the tape series of the guy who's telling you that you're under that. But see, James says faith without works. Now listen, how crazy it's gotten. Some people are even saying take the book of James and Peter out because they don't agree with Paul. Because Paul's the grace preacher. I've heard it. Take them out of the Bible because don't read them. They're not in line with Paul. Paul and, Paul and James didn't have a conflict of doctrine. Paul's talking about living, getting saved by the Old Testament law. James is talking about you're born again, you got faith. Now, live what your faith is. You know, carry out and act on your faith. Do it the way you, if, you're, if you're speaking, it, act on it. All right? And so, still here, aren't I? 
Hallelujah. Um, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now, convenient means to reach to, to aspire to. But they, they're doing things that they wouldn't aspire to. Now, does anybody think that that pastor of that church out in Colorado a few years ago, who ended up, who's going to Colorado to a city about an hour away and spending weeks in the hotel room to write a book and is getting massages and, became a, and started having homosexual sex with the masseuse of one of the biggest churches in America? You think he, he aspired to that? No? See, when you start making decisions against God and that reprobate, now reprobate means void of judgment. You can't make right decisions. When you become void of judgment, you can't make right decisions. You'll make decisions based on everything in the world except what you're supposed to be making it on. You'll make it on the whim. You'll make it on, you know, somebody's look. You'll make it on a conversation. You'll make it on your friend. Well, I tell you what I would do. And these, if they just give that, 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 that little head shake and get the finger and get that little attitude, you know you don't want to hear what they got to say. Because they're going to lead you down the path of destruction before you can even get out of the building. Being filled. Listen, when you become mind void of judgment, you're being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, back, uh, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, and, and inventors of evil things. Some people just dream up evil. A disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Listen to this. This is what happens when you get a reprobate mind. You get a mind void of judgment. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Now wait, where's the love of God here? That people preach in our churches today. In our charismatic word of faith loony circles. I'm a charismatic word of faith. I was old Pentecostal, came over on the word of faith people. Charismatic people. Believe, you know, I believe the word, of, I believe that. But we've got some squirrels in the camp. I mean, you know, they are, I call them granola Christians. Fruits, nuts, and flakes all packaged together in the same box. Hello? I mean, they are crazy. Brother, I heard brother, some people are just crazy. And they are. You start teaching, when God, God, he says, these people know that what they're doing is worthy of death. Yet, not only do them, but have the pleasure in those that do them also. This is a mind that has become reprobate. Why has it become reprobate? Well, look at James 3, verse 14. If you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. Why? The wisdom, this wisdom descendeth not from above. Oh, there's different kinds of wisdom. But it's earthly. Well, where did it come from? It came from the earth. Sensual devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. When you go getting your information from the wrong place and or deciding because the right place doesn't give you the liberty to do what you want to do. That's, that's part of it sometimes. You go to the Bible and it says you cannot do this. Oh, I don't like that. Go find preacher so-and-so who tells me that I'm under grace. It doesn't matter what I do. And I'm going to forget reading the Bible. I'm just going to listen to his tapes because he's make, he makes me feel wonderful. You know, Jesus didn't always make everybody feel wonderful. Now, come on now. Let's get your narratives right. If you're going to have a biblical narrative, let's have a biblical narrative and not have a, d a Dumbo narrative. Jesus stood up one day with a huge following. Looks out at him. Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. Boom. Head to 12. The whole bunch left. He always made people feel better. He didn't make them feel better that day. As a matter of fact, he offended some, offended them so bad they all packed up and left. Think about it now. The whole bunch packed up and left. Looked over at the 12 and said, are you guys going to leave too? Well, you're the only ones who got the words. Of, they, they made a decision to follow after him no matter what. They were going to follow the words of life. You're the only ones who got the words of life. And they stayed. 
And they rebuilt the, they rebuilt the following somewhat. It's about 500 by the time it, you know, he, he was ascended up into heaven. But I'm saying that crowd packed up and left. If Jesus walked the earth for three and a half years, worked all those miracles, signs, wonders, so many that John says, I suppose that the world itself could, if they were all written down, the world itself could not contain the volumes thereof. And everybody left him because of one statement? It wasn't always hunkadory, sloppy agape mess, was it? Think about it. And so someone comes along telling you the truth now, and people get mad. They'll pack up and leave the church. Because they got happy, clappy church down the road. I, listen, I, I want people to be, I want them to be happy. I want them to be full of joy. I want them to prosper. I want them to be well. But we need to do it the biblical way. And not deceive people into believing that going against God's word is going to get you those things. That is tapping into the envy of the oppressor and tapping into doing his ways. Instead of doing it the word of God way. So we're going to make right decisions. It's going to have to come from the Word. Now, let me finish this up here. This particular verse we're in. Over in James. So, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. So the world's wisdom is what? Earthly, sensual, and devilish. Hey, hey, you're out. You know, like an umpire. They don't ever say strike. They say, hey, huh. earthly. Hey, who? sensual. Hey, Devilish. They, they, they just say love. Umpires love to. I umpired a little bit. Remember, I was, on, I was on a field umpire, and we had, we had learned from. Some of y'all seen Joe West. He, he's always a, the umpire that gets trouble in Major League Baseball. A manager getting his face. Well, Joe West is from Greenville. Went to Jamie's high school, and he used to run an umpire camp at our high school when I was in high school, to teaching umpires how to umpire. So I got to learn how to umpire from just being being the baseball guys on the field, you know, and stuff. So I got to do some. I got to do some summer ball umpiring, you know, and so. You know, guys, guy slides in for the tag. You can't see the ball. Show me the ball he's out. I, go, just, I had it. I was cool, man. I had it down. Anyway. <laughs> they come up with the ball. <laughs> well, earthly, central, and devilish. You get into that wisdom and you're out. You're struck out by the devil. Hello? Are you here? Next verse. But the wisdom that is from above. Everybody say the wisdom that's from above. How do we tap into the wisdom that's from above? Number one, the word of God. And then if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God and give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not. How's the Holy Ghost going to give you wisdom? The word of God. He's going to go back to the word to give you the wisdom you need. Hello? <coughs> the wisdom that's from above is first pure, peaceable, Gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace in them that make peace. So here we got, we got wisdom we can get from two different places. Now the wisdom of this world is going to be earthly, sensual, and devilish. Now let me say, it's going to appeal to your flesh, flesh, flesh. Every single time. Think about being a young Christian, unmarried, and somebody come along and say, it doesn't matter if you fornicate, because you're under grace. <laughs> you know what's going? Hormonious. Start going, woo! I can have sex anytime I want to have sex. It don't matter. Because <laughs> I'm under grace. Glory. Boy, what happens? That's a wisdom that's earthly, sensual, and devilish, but it appeals to their flesh. Amen. Then the other preacher comes along and goes, um, that we're not to fornicate. We're to offer our bodies a living sacrifice to God, which is our reasonable or spiritual service. You know, God says that they that live in these type of things have no inheritance in the kingdom of God, and they get bad. <laughs> he's, a, he's a law preacher. He's a hater because he's telling me I can't do what I want to do. No, you've let the wisdom of this world bring your mind to the stage of, of, of reprobateness. That's probably not a word. Being reprobate, and now you're void of judgment. And you make decisions based on what your flesh wants to do instead of what God's word tells you to do. Remember, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life are the three failings of Adam in the garden, the three temptations of Jesus in the, in the mount or in the wilderness. And you have to overcome what? The flesh. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. 
And the word of God will bring decisions that are what? Bring you information that is what? Pure. Thank God it's pure. Amen? Thank God it starts out pure. It doesn't start out bad. It's pure. Peaceable. Oh, there's peace in your house when you're following after God. Amen? Amen? It's gentle. It's easy to be entreated. It's not hard to follow after God when you're making decisions based on the word. When you put the flesh under. I mean, there's, listen, there's days you're about to get out of bed and say, back up there on the cross, boy. Who are you talking? I'm talking to my body. Get back up there. Because you are crucified. I'm going to follow after God. Amen? Amen. No, I sit here like a dog. You might, you know, you might got, now I got a beagle. And you'll tell her, get out of that track. Get over there. And you'll go sit down. And you'll hear, her, her, her toenails hitting the floor and you start hearing around going there and she's back back right right back in it because she's the dogs are flesh ruled their nose just leads them to trouble particularly beagles I mean that nose gets them in more trouble than they can get out of you know you, you'll beat them if you leave them long enough and leave that stuff where it was it'll come right back to it because their flesh is willing to pay the price of getting beat for the opportunity to get the meat. <laughs> Amen. And there are Christians who are willing to, to pay the price of consequences of bad decisions to get to indulge in their flesh. But then they'll blame God or the haters for causing the trouble. Because if they didn't say those things, they would feel better about themselves and they wouldn't be in the place they're in. When the truth of the matter is, they are not in, they're not entreating the, 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 the uh, counsel of God. Amen? It's peaceful, easy to be entreated, full of mercy. Listen, if you're following after God, there's, he's full of mercy. If you're rebelling against God, he's not going to bless you. That one ever big. Without partiality, without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace and then that make peace. We're going to have to stop here. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.